Welcome everybody uh, to this uh, event. I will introduce myself. My name is Mante Buhele Mabeta. I am the WPP Women in Poli Women's Political Participation Manager at Gender Links. We will now start to proceed with our uh, meeting. We know that these top line findings are giving us view and direction into the women's political participation for the rest of Africa, which is really encouraging now because this is the second time now we try to look at Africa in terms of women's political participation because previously the gender links uh, barometers were only looking at the SADC region. So this is a very good thing that we know how our continent stands in terms of having women's political participation. I will now hand over to Josephine to lead us in our first section, which is around uh, getting some welcome remarks from our partners and our donors, International ID. Josephine, please take it through. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Josephine Mwangi, um, the program manager for the Women in Political Participation program. And um, I will start by uh, just saying a few words. Uh, happy International Women's Day to you all. Um, we warmly welcome all the participants uh, who have joined us and um, we want to say that the women's political participation in Africa barometer um, takes stock on where we are at in Africa in terms of uh, women's political participation. Today's webinar is, will be two hours, and this is a product of rigorous research, um, which aims to present just the top line uh, results. And we hope that this uh, presentation will leave you yearning for more information for policy and uh, legislation as well as implementation. To start us off, uh, I will ask the donor who is um, CEDA from the Addis office, uh, Ms. Emebet Regassa to speak uh, for just five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for organizing this very important event to you all. Uh, in fact, I have to say good afternoon and good morning as per the, the time we are in. And happy International Women's Day for uh, all of us. Uh, and I'm really uh, glad, uh, grateful to uh, give a remark on this very important day, especially given the fact that uh, uh, international idea and all our partners are successful in making this uh, WPP barometer, which is crucial for the import, for the progress of for the success of uh, WPP. Uh, as we know, the 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 motto of uh, International Women Day for this year: investing in women and accelerating progress. Uh, it is uh, known that investing in women uh, uh, requires clear understanding. Uh, especially understanding of the context, uh, understanding of the political willingness, understanding of um, attitude of the community, attitude of uh, both women and the men, boys and the girls, and uh, to understand the uh, this all context and this all thing, we need uh, crucial, critical evidence which is reliable and which is um, uh, tangible, uh, especially for our intervention. Uh, especially when we work with uh, women political participation, which is part of gender transformative uh, programming. As we know, gender transformative programming uh, focuses uh, mainly not on condition, but in changing position. This changing position requires uh, changing the power relation between men and the women and uh, changing the decision making trends, which is uh, which used to be challenging for the past several years, even though we have been trying to address the inequality across uh, the continent and in fact in the world. Uh, but um, the, the launching of this uh, WPP barometer, uh, I hope 
will change uh, several things for us, especially to have clear paths and to have uh, clearly designed intervention to improve the changes and uh, see the impacts that we want to, uh, uh, we aspire to see. And uh, 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 again, uh, this this uh, improving women political participation can be um, uh, addressed majorly through uh, advocacy, which uh, advocacy is the major approach, as we know, especially to fight inequalities. And all advocacies shall be based on evidence, uh, concrete evidence. So this um, the uh, concrete evidence means uh, when you have an evidence, we can like a, lead, a meaningful conversation, a meaningful communication, a meaningful uh, negotiation, and we will have the, 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 the opportunity to convince key stakeholders to have a critical role in terms of like enhancing this woman political participation. So uh, uh, on behalf of SIDA, I would like to congratulate uh, for this success, all international idea and all partners. And I would like to also appreciate your effort to make this happen and uh, to launch the first launching on this uh, historical day. And I also hope that the launch of uh, WPP Barometer will uh, improve several aspects of WPP. And we hope we will have a long pass together to enhance women's political participation and uh, realize the effort of uh, increasing the number of women in leadership and uh, the, the role of women in decision making. Uh, so we will expect a positive, uh, more positive outcomes from all of the aspects. Uh, I thank you all for uh, your commitment for, to make this program and to let us have this remark. And I wish you again to have a really memorable International Women's Day with the launch of uh, WPP Barometer. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Josephine, for that. Now we will move into our second session of the day, which is the actual thing that we came for, which is now looking on or going into the top line findings of the women's political participation barometer. And this section will be led by our barometer guru, Mayor Colin Loemona, who will be leading us through the presentations. And as the presentations are ongoing, we will be running a poll on questions around the views of the participants here around political participation. So we will be expecting you to give us your answers on your views as this is ongoing, to get to understand how you view women's political participation. Over to Sorry. you, Mekulin. Sorry, I think Dr. Roba is now in, huh? Dr. Oh, okay, Roba okay, is now joined. Yes, um, Dr. Roba, uh, you give us please your call, uh, remarks in, uh, you have five minutes. And uh, thank you very much for joining. Dr. Roba, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. I think you can hear me well now. Very well. Yeah. Okay, thank yes. you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my apologies for joining and also apologies for the the technical confusions. Uh, but let me let me first of all say um, we are very honored, uh, you know, as international idea, uh, really to uh, to be uh, able to celebrate uh, this international day. Uh, you can hear me well. I'm I'm having a little bit of a challenge. You are very much audible. We hear you okay. well. Okay. All right. So thank you because I was hearing the French interpretation as well. Um, okay. 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 Another logistics. Once you select English, please mute original audio so that you are not distracted by the French. You select English. After selecting English, click on the same link. There is a blue thing that says on oh, mute original radio. So once uh -huh. you put the original audio, uh, the French I, won't distract you. I, I got it now. Hello? Thank you. Is it better? You can hear me? We can hear you clearly. OK, thank you very much. First, I think let me really uh, stand on the established protocols. I want to really uh, first begin by um, uh, wishing all mothers, all our colleagues, all our girls and daughters, 
uh, and friends, uh, happy uh, International Women's Day. And just to say that really this is a very important day and we are very glad that uh, uh, the WPP consortium partners were able to pull off this very, very important product on such a very uh, momentous day. And I want to thank the leadership uh, of our very important uh, partner, the Gender Links, uh, uh, and the colleagues who have really worked very hard uh, and the management of Gender Links really to, for having pulled off this very important um, uh, uh, barometer, Africa barometer, uh, on women in political participation on such an important day. Let me also uh, at the outset, because I have only five minutes, uh, to thank SIDA, uh, uh, Sweden, uh, Swedish International Development Agency, uh, the government and the people of Sweden really for the support to this very, very important uh, uh, program and the consortium partners. Uh, at International IDEA, I also bring you the greetings from our Secretary General, uh, Kevin Casaza Moras, uh, who is also really a champion of women empowerment uh, and women in political participation. And really from the member states of International IDEA, which is now uh, 35 member states uh, with two observers, uh, basically Japan and the United States who have also joined as an observer and also France, who have actually joined as a member state uh, recently. And I want to thank uh, the member state really for their continued support. Uh, from our side, really, uh, this report is going to be extremely important as international idea. We produce every year what is called the Global State of Democracy uh, report. You will be able to see the one that pro we produced recently. And I will encourage uh, my colleagues, uh, Josephine and the team uh, to actually put the link of the last GOCD uh, in the in the group chat here. Uh, this theme uh, of the W uh, International Women's Day is about inspiring inclusion. And I want to assure you that uh, in the international ideas, um, uh, demo, uh, uh, institutional um, uh, strategy for the next few years, uh, the aspects around inclusion of women and youth um, climate change and other uh, aspects are also really very important. So the aspects about inclusion and inclusion of uh, women in politics to really occupy the position of decision making and power and and, and power is really really uh, something that is at the core uh, of the institute mandate. And I want to really uh, say that we are really looking forward uh, to receiving the findings from this barometer to be able to look at uh, areas where we need to uh, improve to also celebrate the areas where we have actually made progress. And I want to, to really say that uh, without preempting uh, the findings uh, that we are going to have, uh, that they are also going to be quite important election uh, in the region uh, this year. And I know there's going to be election in South Africa, uh, in Namibia, in Botswana, in Mauritius, uh, quite a number of IDEA member states, and particularly the members, the, the countries which are covered by the WPP uh, program. And so we hope that um, uh, we are going to see quite a, a progress in terms of the indicators and the change that we aspire. So let me let me let me stop by really uh, making an appeal that uh, we take the recommendations from this report very seriously. Let's do a lot of advocacy around it uh, to our parliaments, to our legislators, to our people uh, in, in 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 positions of power, and we will, as international idea, continue to walk the journey with you. But let me also end by really thanking the WPP team. Uh, around the table and also really the, the partners of the consortium for the excellent job that we continue to do. So let's pull and we need to make sure that we advocate on the findings and ensure that these findings go uh, uh, to all the policymakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roba. I had already handed over to Mekolin to lead us through the uh, barometer findings. Uh, once more, welcome everyone who has just joined. Please select the uh, translation or the interpretation, and then you select English or French. And from there, please select mute the original audio so that you can only hear the language that you have selected. This information is still being, I'm still sharing it on the chat. Please look out for the chat for any announcement as we give uh, Time for getting now the actual results. Over to you, Mekolin, to lead this session. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me loud and clear, and I hope you can see my screen. All good on that front? All, all good to hear. Ah, with you. Hallelujah. Okay. Let me just also add my uh, greetings on International Women's Day to all the wonderful 
uh, women and men around the table. Um, one of the slight advantages of the technical glitches we had is that more people got to enter the room. I see we have over 50 participants from all parts of the continent, and uh, we welcome you so warmly on this day. I'm really privileged today to be joined by the, the uh, always when you see a glossy publication like this, uh, there's a team of foot soldiers who have been doing this work tirelessly, some of them through the Christmas holiday, gathering this data, checking it, verifying it. And so I'm very privileged today to be joined by that team and each one of the uh, chapter authors will be speaking to their uh, particular findings. Mine is just to uh, introduce and help to, to, to break this down a little bit. As Josephine said, uh, what you're getting now is really hors d'oeuvres. Uh, this is starters, this is uh, teasers for you. The main launch will be um, in May, which is Africa Month, as you know, so very appropriate. Um, in fact, we plan to launch not quite on Africa Day, which is the 25th of May, but on the 27th of May in Nairobi. So just a heads up for those of you <clears throat> who might be in Nairobi, that the real, the real deal, the real meal is coming uh, in May. But th these teasers, I know, are going to uh, appetize you, and you will definitely want to find out more. As Dr. Roba said, the theme today is inclusion. Uh, what could be more exclu excluding of women than these mainstream political spaces, the spaces where major decisions are made um, over our lives? And the international idea and many others have said that until we have gender parity in every space of political decision making, we cannot talk about democracy. Democracy means equal participation by everyone. Our parliaments are meant to be a mirror of our population. If more than half of our population are women and they are not there, then we have a problem. In the uh, highlights, which by the way are available in English and French, both on the GenLinks web website and on the International Idea website, you, we start off with that kind of checkerboard just to help you see what has gone forward or backwards during this period. And in black is the current position as in 2024, and in brackets are the figures for 2021, uh, which is when we did the last barometer. This is a tracking uh, tool. And if you look at that just at a glance, you can see that by and large, you know, Africa as a whole, we've gone forward. Um, if we break it down by region as the AU does into the Horn, East, Southern, Central, and North Africa. But there's so many cases of one step forward, two step backwards, or staying in the same place. So about 65% of that chart is showing us going forward. Uh, but uh, you can see that, you know, 30% or so is uh, still, it's gone backwards and 5% is staying in the same place. And what my colleagues are gonna do today is break that down. Also, let me just say, these are the parameters that we measure, 10 parameters around women's political participation, 2021 and again in 2024. The lower houses of parliament, the upper houses of parliament, not everyone has upper houses, so we split them. We then put those together as parliament overall. We have tracking around local government, just to say local government figures are notoriously difficult to get hold of, but we keep edging forward on that front. And what an important area of political participation for us to be tracking and to persist in tracking, because honestly, if it doesn't begin from the ground floor, how is it going to get to the top floor? Um, we look at political parties, it's so important because that is where Politicians should uh, be trained and groomed to go into political decision making, and you'll hear more about that. We look at election management itself and the election monitoring bodies uh, that are responsible. Are they walking this talk of gender equality? We look at those upper echelons, the uh, speakers, the mayors of capital cities, top executive positions, as in presidents, uh, deputy presidents, uh, and those uh, very top leaders. And then, of course, we look at cabinet at all. So these are the metrics. These are the parameters that we've looked at in terms of WPP. So if we look at parliament, which is the area, of course, that we are all, uh, you know, very uh, uh, familiar with, um, you will see that the um, position, uh, sorry, sorry, this is not parliament. This is all those 10 parameters I've just mentioned. 
you will see that generally speaking, the trend is, 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 um, is upwards. Uh, the green is 21, the blue is 24. So you can see that generally speaking, there's been a little bit of an advance, but it's very important to say that in parliament overall, we have had just a one percentage point increase. So in these three years, just a one percentage point increase. And as you can see, we're sitting at about 25%. So let's do the math. If we were to get to parity, and it's taking us three years just to get one percentage point, those of you who are good at math, I throw that to you as a challenge and you can post the figure in the chat. How many years is it? A nice little math question. How many years would it take us at this rate, one percentage point every three years to get to parity? Clearly, we're not going to meet the 2030 target uh, at, this, uh, at this rate. So what are we going to do about this? Um, breaking it down by region is useful because then we can see where is the progress and where not. And we can see here, interestingly, that if we track over time, this is a bit encouraging, start from 2000, the turn of the millennium, look at Africa as a whole, we actually began at 9%, went up to 17, went up to 26. So that's, um, you know, that shows at least progress, at least we're moving in the right direction overall. Again, this is participation uh, in parliament. And in some regions, you can see really very, you know, significant growth uh, over that period. Uh, the one that is quite interesting to us um, is West Africa, which started from a very low base, uh, but where there has been uh, quite a bit of uh, progress in the last period. However, still lagging behind uh, the other regions. So, of course, that prompts an interesting question. Why are some regions moving more quickly than others? This slide is also very interesting. These are all the countries of Africa. And what can you tell us? We are the region, <laughs> you know, the continent, beg your pardon, in the world that has uh, the highest representation of women in one of our countries in Rwanda. So just very proud to be the continent that houses Rwanda with 61% women. And you know, what a story to tell about WPP in Rwanda. But we are also the continent uh, where the most populous country in Africa, as we all know, is Nigeria. About a quarter of the, uh, the continent lives in Nigeria. And yet WPP in Nigeria is only 4%. And everyone else is sitting uh, somewhere in between uh, those numbers. So what a big range and what a big question to ask again about if it's working in some countries, why not uh, in others? This is some statistics we've managed to compile on local government, incomplete, but um, useful. And it also shows us that by and large, women's political participation in local government is lower than it is at the national level. And that prompts an interesting question as well. One would imagine that at the local level, there would be more space, more room uh, for WPP. But no, perhaps the forces of uh, culture and tradition and whatever else is holding women back are even greater at the local level. And so we still see uh, these big uh, disparities in local government, and Susan will have uh, more to say about that. What is interesting is that in the last three years, we've actually had 31 uh, elections in Africa. So there was plenty of possibility for change during that period. Let's just bear that in mind. Also, just to say, by the way, certainly I know in Southern Africa, and others may chime in as well, that we've got lots of elections in 2024. This is the year... 24, we have, oh, I don't know, Botswana and Mozambique and South Africa and, uh, uh, oh, you can name so many others, at least five or six elections, Namibia, that are taking place this year. So we have many more coming up in 2024 and many more uh, possibilities for that. So we had um, all these elections, I won't go through them, that happened in this uh, tracking period. We tried to present this information again, we like color coding because it just helps us to see things. Uh, of those countries that had elections, which ones moved forward, um, which ones stood at the same place, which ones uh, moved backwards. Um, and you can see that actually the most number of countries that had the big jump over 10% in those three years was in West Africa. We're going to unpack that in a moment, but let's just bear that in mind. At the same time, as you can see, we had 
quite a number of countries, sadly, that went backwards by some quite high uh, percentage points. This is for, um, for national uh, uh, politics. And then when we look at uh, local uh, government, um, we see a few countries that move forward. Uh, Zimbabwe is certainly one of them, Morocco, uh, quite a number that just kind of stagnated, stayed in the same place. And then a few, including, uh, shame to say, because I'm speaking to you from South Africa, a few that actually move backwards, Lesotho and South Africa uh, at the local level. So I want to pause for a moment. West Africa had the most number of elections from 2021 to 2023. Um, and this region had the highest number of countries that registered an increase of over 10 percentage uh, points, uh, but also the highest number of countries, six, which stayed the same or regressed. So a typical story, it seems, in West Africa of one step backwards, uh, two step, you know, well, maybe two steps forward, one step backwards. So this kind of constant push-pull uh, that is happening. I'm just delighted that today, and I hope she's in the room now, that uh, we have uh, Eline Tien, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing it, it correctly, who's technical advisor to IFAN, one of our partners in the I uh, in the yeah. WPP consortium, to just reflect for us uh, for a moment, um, you know, what exactly is going on in um, in in West Africa, uh, Eline, you're welcome. Was on a, on a, uh, there are some some difficulties in connecting, but uh, uh, but now it's okay. Okay. She just arrived in the webinar. She says. Mm -hmm. I received a presentation of the results of a barometer on women's political participation. And in West Africa, I want to to uh, congratulate Jandeling and the consultant for this work with uh, with the support of EDI International. And this allows us to see the results. I won't be long. In West Africa, we 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 have followed these results. Eleven countries, as as you just said, Pauline, have had elections, and they have had prog uh, progress. Uh, various progress and 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 also re regressed, but I would like to talk about the context in uh, West Africa. The political context in the region is very difficult. With countries which are in transition, a lot of them are in transition in uh, democratic transition, and in the context of transi transition. The women's political participation. These transitions impact negatively on the women's political participation. The context is very uh, important on real, on the women's political participation, but we must uh, congratulate or uh, that three countries. Five countries. It's it's a good thing that five countries went uh, went more went over ten percent uh, in the uh, general elections. On these uh, ten countries or five countries. Two countries uh, are uh, leading transitions, are experiencing transitions, Burkina Faso and Guinea. But they, they had significant and appreciative results of 10%, even though the political context wasn't so good. We, we must analyze these elements 
when when we look at the countries who have regressed like Guinea Bissau, we, we must consider these elements with uh, more than ten percent. And in this country there is the the par uh, application of law on parity uh, is 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 a problem. It isn't working as it sh it should be. We cannot understand how in a country where there is a law on parity, uh, we get this uh, type of result, which is less ten percent for uh, legislative elections. We cannot understand that. As if I'm trying to figure out what is going on in Nigeria, I didn't have time to have a have a, have a look to understand uh, this regression. But for the others. We, we started from zero to uh, five percent. I'll, I'll take the case of Senegal. There is a law on parity, but today we are only at 47% of women in parliament. We, we want to get 50% because the law of parity should give us a minimum of 50% of women in parliament. In the, lo in the local government, we have also uh, experience and evolution, a very timid one. But we did, uh, we did uh, get a jump in Senegal. Then about the results, we must appreciate the participation of women. For the first time, we had 146 candidates uh, with all the programs that we that we, we did with the international because we, we managed to do campaigns and get a lot number of candidates. In some of the, in some of the uh, uh, countries, the law has changed. In local in Senegal in, for the local elections, the law has changed. Uh, to be a candidate, you must be on uh, top top. You must top the list. If we hadn't had the uh, support of IDEA, we would have get the number of mayors that we we had because the law uh, could be a great constraint for women. So with the international, we managed to change that and get a lot number of of women as candidates for the uh, local government elections. The factors, I believe, these factors, these factors which uh, uh, ended the women's political participation. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like also to stress the place of women in the governance uh, spaces in political parties. If you look at the results of a barometer, women in top positions in political parties are, are very, the percentage is very low. There is a lot of uh, challenges to be, uh, to be, uh, dealt with in these uh, in these uh, political parties women are still backwards there it is it is in these uh, posts that the decisions are taken in the uh, women's focus we had to do a, a study there was a, a study before we started our acti activities on the, uh, the presence of women in political parties and we have noticed that uh, that the leadership in the political parties, uh, women's presence was uh, was very few, was few. In Senegal, you've got eighteen political parties created and 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 led by women, but nobody, 
does not know, nobody knows them. Three or four are known uh, by the public, but most of them are not, are not known. Visibility of uh, political, uh, women political leaders, there is, this is a constraint. We, we must work on this visibility. We have tried to, to work on the women's visibility in, and, the, and the participation of political debate. But uh, we have tried to work on, on that. So as I say again, 18 political parties uh, led by women, but most of them are unknown. This is a, a, a factor, uh, a barrier. And then in the parties, the, the women are kept in, in, in inferior roles, not, not strategic roles. You, re you barely see a woman who will, uh, who will uh, manage the elections uh, of a party or uh, the communication or who will be a secretary general of a party. It's, it's, it's very, very rare. Because of time, we might need to start moving up. I'm wondering if uh, Madame Eline can start wrapping up. <laughs> So uh, this uh, this which determines uh, women's political participation. Should we start wrapping up, Mass? So to summarize, we, we did have uh, progress in West Africa in terms of, uh, of women in elective uh, positions after elections, local and national elections. But in a, a political context, which is very difficult in West Africa, we've got lots of challenge to, to work on and uh, on one of them being uh, pre the presence of women in the uh, in the decision uh, in the decision making position po in political parties that's it merci beaucoup thank you so much uh, for that insight um how interesting and i just want to pick up on one of the points that was made that here we have um in a sea of countries that's not doing so well we have senegal standing out and i think that uh Madame uh, Eline has given us some clue as to why that is so. She spoke about an electoral law, a law that provides for gender parity. So now we're going to ask for a little bit of audience participation. Uh, as part of the barometer that you're going to get in May, uh, the full barometer, we have been undertaking a survey to see what people in the, um, you know, what people think about women's political participation and what are the factors that might enable women's political participation. Uh, and we'll give you the results of that with full barometer, but let's do a little bit of testing just here in the room, uh, just to uh, make sure that we're all together. So I'm going to um, switch, off from, uh, switch over for a moment to our technical team and ask them to put up the first of our poll questions. Is it necessary to have legislated quotas for women in politics to bring about gender balance in decision making? Do we agree that we need to have quotas if we're going to change the way that things are? So let me um, stop sharing and um, hand over to, um, uh, to the technical team. Mema Beta, are we ready with our poll? Yes, it has come up. Um, uh, I'm not seeing it. Is, are others seeing it? I can see it. Yes, yeah. we, yes we, we, we have it. to we click on the, the, uh, the answer that we have. Is it necessary to have legislated quota for women in politics to bring about gender balance? If you strongly agree, select on strongly agree, disagree, neutral agree, strongly agree. and to submit after making your selection. OK, 
Okay, we're going to give everyone a few minutes to be, uh, a minute really, <laughs> to do that. I think maybe uh, we'll have the results right at the end. Shall we do that? Yeah, uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, everyone just has a minute. Have we all found the poll? The poll? Uh, have we been able to um, uh, to fill it in? And um, if we have, we're going to uh, keep that result for um, uh, at the end, we'll come to uh, all of the results. All good, everyone had a chance, I hope. And now I'm going to circle over to um, uh, one of our main uh, authors, co-editor of the barometer, uh, Susan Tolme, uh, research and gender and researcher on gender and governance uh, with gender links who's going to take us through uh, in a few minutes uh, the importance of electoral systems and call them temporary special measures, call them quotas, whatever you'd like to, but a little bit of social engineering uh, to try and bring about this change that we are seeking. So over to you, Susan. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Colleen, and, and um, for Madam Ellen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to be with you today. Um, so, in this first section, in the in in the so the chapter that um, around electoral systems and quotas um, is really to try and make the point um, around what impact, you know, the electoral systems and quotas have um, on women's political participation. Um, you know, not, not all electoral systems are equal and not all electoral systems are um, yield the same results. Um, in Africa, we have three main um, electoral systems, the first past the post, which is a winner takes all, um, it's constituency based, the proportional representation system, uh, seats are awarded in proportion to the number of votes a political party gets. And then the mixed system is a combination of both. So there are some constituency seats and some PR seats. Um, now, research has shown, we've done a lot of research, and this research reaffirms the fact that PR systems are more conducive um, for women uh, to, to, to get into uh, political, um, into decision-making positions. Uh, but there are fewer countries that actually use the system. So the majority of countries um, actually use the first-past-the-post system. Um, 20 both at local government and local um, and lower house, uh, fewer, only slightly fewer for the PR and then, um, you know, about half uh, are using the mixed system, which we see is, is quite conducive. Um, and uh, as as we know, uh, we've spoken about South Africa is is going to an uh, election this year, um, and our electoral law was declared unconstitutional because it wouldn't actually allow um, independence to stand. So it's also seen as more demo It's also seen as more demographic and more democratic. Uh, next slide. So this uh, graph shows you the green, uh, the green is the PR system, the yellow is the mixed, and the red is the first past the post. And you'll see from the graph that the countries with um, some of the highest levels of representation are um, using the PR system. Senegal is slightly different. Um, but as I said, mixed systems with uh, quotas are also very uh, conducive to getting women um, represented. Uh, Uganda and Ethiopia here uh, have relatively high, even though they use the first past the post system. And that just goes to show that there are a, a range of other factors that come into play as well. So these are the bottom 10 <laughs> countries. So Nigeria, as, um, as Colleen said, has the lowest representation. But you can see in the bottom five, we go from 15% to 4%. And the majority, again, here um, are countries that are using the first past the post system. Uh, so just quickly, uh, recently, um, ahead of the elections in Sierra Leone, um, the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Act was um, was was launched, uh, and it promotes women's access to finance and employment. 
Um, within this act, they established the 30% quota for women's participation, um, specifically for appointed positions, including cabinet, the ministry, ambassador roles. So across the um, across the whole spectrum, which sometimes doesn't happen. Often quotas or electoral systems apply at a national level and a local level differently. Um, and um, as a result of this, the representation increased in parliament in the lower house from 14.5% to, to 28%. So, you know, 14, you know, almost 14% increase in one election. So I think that's a good indication or that's a good example of how quotas, the, the point of the quota is, you know, to 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 boost women's representation. They aren't meant to be there forever. Um, and they're normally limited to, to a certain number of um, elections. Um, this is just, I'll just quickly um, talk here. In the combination of the electoral systems and quotas, there's three quota systems, a legislated quota, reserved seats, and then a voluntary party quota where political parties choose of their own accord to have a, have a quota. Um, you'll see that uh, the PR system has the best results across the board. Um, in terms of systems, but the, the 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 voluntary party quota, even though three only three countries use it in Africa, it it's yielded the highest representation um, of of women. Um, and the PR system with a quota also has the highest level of representation. Um, the first past the post um, has uh, lower representation. Uh, they have few more countries that don't um, have quotas. Um, and then the mixed system, uh, they, they also have um, relatively high uh, representation there. Uh, for the um, for for the local government level, um, they, they they it's similar at that level. Fewer parties have uh, voluntary party quotas, and there more parties use uh, reserved seats, um, and that has resulted in higher representation in all uh, electoral systems except the mixed system, where there what we see, and it's a system that is actually in Senegal at the moment. The legislated quota um, works works well in the mixed system. But interestingly, there um, at the local government level, um, countries using the mixed system uh, have lower representation uh, than in countries um, that that use it. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. We go on to yes. our next our next chapter. Yes. Uh, sorry, no, I'm I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Macaulay. Yes, okay. Mama Beta says she can hear me. Okay. Uh, I hope everyone else can hear me. Uh, uh, All right. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Susan, maybe you need to get back in the English room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So we're going to move on. Thank you so much for that presentation on electoral systems and um, quotas. A complicated area, many, many different permutations, but I think we see the general trend. Certain electoral systems, the PR in particular, are much more conducive to women's political participation because there you're voting for a party, you're not voting for a person. Uh, in the first past the post system, you're voting for individuals and therefore money and influence and all those other things that belong to the boys club uh, become um, uh, a big barrier for women. Uh, we've also seen that there are all sorts of possible combinations of quotas with those systems. And that without doubt, uh, countries that have quotas have a higher representation than, than those who don't. But such an interesting uh, finding around voluntary party quotas, because what that is showing is that where the quota is legislated, yes, you can force the change, but it's much better to have the quota being voluntary because then there is ownership by the political parties. The question is, and I think that uh, Madame Eline sort of hinted at that, is are the parties themselves walking the talk? Uh, what are they doing uh, within their own structures to promote women's political participation? So to get us thinking about that, we're going to pause again for another poll. We're going to show these results at the end. But our next question is this. 
political parties are more likely to nominate women candidates for seats in which they are less likely to win than is the case for men, particularly, of course, in the first past the post system. So is there a discrimination in which, in the way in which uh, that ends? So uh, we, sorry, you're showing the wrong question polls. It should not be making a difference. It should be the poll on political parties, unless I'm seeing the wrong one. Is ever oh, sorry, um, is everyone seeing the right one? Political parties is the poll question. We're no, the to. wrong one has been launched, Colina. I was also making him aware, and yeah, that is the wrong one. Okay, um, uh, have we been able to find it? Can we find it? Please launch the one that says political parties. Do I need to exit the screen? Can everyone see it? I can see it. It's just that the wrong question has been launched. That's all. But okay, I see can, it. can we get the right question up, um, GL team? <laughs> Uh, Tando, have we got the right question coming up? Is the right question come up? Okay, if not, I'm going to suggest we bring it up uh, perhaps after the presentation uh, okay. because I'm very conscious of time. So our next presentation is on political parties. And joining me here is our chapter author, who is Pamela Dube, joining us from Botswana. Pam, are you there? Pam, can you come into the English room? Can you select English? English, yes, I've selected. You're, you're in, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, am I audible? Very much so, thank, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I believe it's afternoon everywhere. If it's not, good morning. Uh, happy Women's Day. Yes, um, like Pauline says, now this one is the most challenging one of political parties because this is the what I'll refer to as the feedlot of all political systems. Um, and being the feedlot or being the, the, the foundation of political um, uh, women's uh, participation, political participation, that becomes quite a challenging one because it needs to be at a level where we can be able to say what is it that is happening uh, as regard to women's political participation at that level. Now, since the, the last barometer in 2023 or in 2021, we have picked that uh, our assessment of political part women's representative representation in executive positions of main political parties across the African nation has dropped. Uh, as you can see from the graph there, there's is there has been a drop from 12%, which was also already quite low, but now to 9%. Uh, this covers 114 political parties from all the 54 countries in the African continent. Now, as you can see from the graph, um, the, the green shows the previous um, uh, results from 2021. The purple represents uh, the current ones from the 2024. And only Southern Africa has had an upward mobility from 14% to 19%. And the only other block with um, which has registered anything really is the East African, but with a slight drop from 15% to 11. All the other blocks are, have registered 0%. Um, interestingly, in the last barometer, you had the Horn of Africa, which was leading at 17%, and there was a serious dramatic drop from 17 to zero percent there may be there are many reasons for that 
the situation in the Horn of Africa is what uh, you'll see to be one of the reasons why political activism has gone down and therefore women's participation on its own has gone down. You also have the West and the Central Africa, which dropped from 11% to 7% respectively, and North Africa remained at 0%. So this, uh, the, the, the statistics as um, are reflected here. Now, there are many reasons why we find ourselves in this uh, situation where there is a serious, serious lack of um, leadership of women in political parties. Now, the, the three uh, positions that we looked at were the president of the party, the secretary general, and the deputy secretary general. This is because these are the real power houses of political parties. And you'll find that in this, or, or in our assessment, we found that even where women are in those three structures, you'll find them in the positions of deputy secretary general. In the majority, the men still remain at the top two, which is the, the president and the secretary general. And even if we were to take the executive positions with all the political parties, which is the president, the national chairperson, the secretary general, the treasurer, you name it, usually it's where the men are. The women come in at the level of deputy secretary general. So that's the concern we need to uh, highlight. And also where there the, are uh, voluntary quarters, as, as Susan was speaking about, you find that um, different uh, countries where there are legislated quotas, the ruling parties, most of the time, they do have voluntary quotas of, uh, of between 20 and 50%. Even where they are there, even up to the level of 50%, there is no stipulation as to where women should fit in those um, positions. You find that even the political commitment is very limited in that regard because women there are found mainly in the uh, additional position membership. Even when the party says you should have representation of women across board in all the leadership positions, you are going to find them in additional um, you know, members positions, which are not very effective in the leadership of each party. Um, this here, as you see in your screen, is a quote from Margaret Nyahoda, who's a councillor in the Nyanga District Council in Zimbabwe. She says, and she's speaking the language that you'll find a lot of women in political parties will tell you. She says, one of the most significant challenges was my entrance into, entrance into politics. It is very difficult for women because no because one has to be nominated by their political party first, where several names may be put forward and they go through the primary elections to choose not only one person to represent the what. It is at this point that most women find it difficult because they will then need to begin campaign canvassing for votes. And this is where the challenge is. Campaigns are by their nature very expensive. Um, unfortunately, due to the patriarchal structure of families, most women do not have the control of the family finances. Fortunately for me, I had a personal project that allowed me to fund myself, which still was not enough, but at least there was a starting point. So these are the kind of issues that uh, will be raised that financial, lack of financial, uh, means even to contest within the political party structure if you don't have the means or you don't have the financial or family backing or any kind of backing really, any kind of support, it is very unlikely that you'll find yourself in those highly contested positions, which are the top three positions in, in the party. So um, this basically our key fundings, which we, we, we will expand as uh, the report comes out. Thank you very much, Colleen. Thank you, Pam. Looking forward to that chapter. Wow, imagine uh, that in the top echelons of our political parties, we have gone from a paltry 12% to even lower now 9%. What does that say 
uh, as we're moving towards 2030, the uh, deadline for sustainable development goals that our political parties are lagging so far behind. So they vote for one thing in parliament, but in their own structures, they're not walking the talk. And that is such an indicator of the fundamental patriarchal uh, structure of our society uh, that still uh, so much uh, exists. I'm going to move on now to uh, Kevin uh, Chiramba, uh, who was our chapter author for the management of elections. So uh, simple fact, in almost all of our countries now, we have independent bodies of one kind or the other, independent electoral commissions that manage our elections. And that has been a really good thing in terms of the democratic uh, transitions and progress that has happened in many uh, countries, that there is a body that is uh, put in place, normally uh, nominated positions, um, perhaps through parliament, but these are not elected positions as such. They are, they are appointments. And so the question we ask is the electoral management bodies themselves, who are they? Uh, where, how is gender reflected in their makeup? But also very cru crucially, uh, you know, what, uh, what role do they play uh, in terms of the management of elections and in terms of ensuring gender responsive elections? Because there's so much we can do uh, within the actual management of elections to be gender responsive and gender aware. Over to you, Kevin. Great. Thank you so much. So, yeah, and um, yep, International Day to, to you all colleagues. Uh, just to, to reflect on this, um, on this slide before us, where um, we, are we are being shown the structure of our electoral management bodies in terms of uh, women's leadership across Africa. So if you can see, um, it shows that from our baseline in 2021, uh, we, we do not have major changes per se, but um, the whole of Africa region, uh, we had some slight changes, uh, for example, 2% from 28% to 30% in 2024. There's not been so much change in East Africa, but as you can also see, there's, there's been a slight decline in Southern Africa and also um, uh, perhaps what, could, what we could say a significant change in the Horn of Africa. So this just goes to show you, uh, you know, the, 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 the structure of how, you know, the leadership of election, election management bodies is in, 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 in the entire uh, Africa. So what, 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 um, what 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 this actually tells us is that um uh for each and every uh you know uh election cycle uh there are, there are some changes that are also done to electoral management bodies in different countries and this also affects the gender distribution within those uh within those countries okay can we go to the next slide all right, um, the next slide is actually around women um, in politics, their experience of gender-based violence. And we have, uh, uh, Kevin did that chapter as well, so hang in there, Kevin. Um, but um, we have a poll question around women's uh, political, uh, women's experience of gender-based violence. Can I just check with the team if you have the poll questions ready? Can we go to the poll question around women experiencing uh, gender-based violence? And the question is, so women in politics experience more gender-based violence compared to men. Please also feel free to uh, post your views in the chat. Uh, do we have the poll question ready, please? Yes. Do we, have the, do we have the poll question ready? Yeah, this one. Electoral mm -hmm. management. Just yes. one. Yeah? Yes, yes. yes. Cool. Do we have the poll question ready, please? Mm -hmm. Sorry, if not. Uh, yeah. If not, yes? Uh, Yes, we've launched. Um, okay, have we launched it? Are, are people seeing it on their screens? Women in politics experience more gender-based violence compared to men? Nope, I don't see it. 
No, we have one is not yeah. coming up. I, I guess we can take the views on the chat, Mekulin, as you yes, suggested. Let's do that. Yeah. So what do we think? Women in politics experience more exactly. gender-based violence than men. Do we agree? And then, Kevin, we're going to pass over to you to um, to talk us through that. Yeah? OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so as you might be aware, you know, uh, violence in general, uh, violence against women in general, is um uh is a is a is a, is a societal problem that we we face a, and it transcends boundaries uh Africa or globally. But uh, just to let you know some of the findings uh in this chapter where um uh you know a study by the you know IPU has shown that um uh with, with women parliamentarians has shown that 80 percent have suffered psychological violence. This form of violence actually includes insults, you know, things like defamation, uh, and sorts. Uh, Sixty-seven percent of parliamentarians have also, you know, suffered sexist uh, remarks. Forty-two uh, percent have, you know, you know, been subjected to threats which include death, rape, or threats of being beaten or getting abducted. Uh, Forty percent have also, you know, experienced uh, uh, various uh, forms of harassment, and 23% uh, of, of, of the respondents showed that they've, you know, suffered physical violence. So just to let you know, uh, some of them, uh, you know, we've been trying to interrogate this data to say, so who is being, who are the perpetrators and so forth. So in our findings, you, you actually see that, um, uh, the UN Women has actually shown that uh, majority of these perpetrators are coming from within the political parties, the the male rivalries to the to the women uh, political candidates, and some of the perpetrators also include family and friends, community leaders, such as leader, religious leaders, as well as uh, you know violence also coming from the security forces, including the police. So. Um, on this slide that is just before you, uh, you are being shown, you know, uh, you know, picture of Anta Babaka Ngong, uh, who is from Senegal. She has also been a presidential election candidate uh, for the election that was initially penciled for the 24th of February in, in uh, Senegal. But the, as you might know, the elections have since been postponed and we are not so sure yet of when the elections will happen, but probably this year, later this year. So there she's actually highlighting some of the you know, challenges that she has faced in terms of violence, including intimidations, you know, smear campaigns. And she even talks about um, you know, violence you know, being perpetrated from the media houses, you know, comments by also other influencers on our social media, and also even comments uh, you know, coming, uh, you know, addressing a dress code, which is also never done to other you know, political uh, male candidates. So this is just testimony to show you how, uh, you know, violence against women in politics is perpetrated and also some of the forms that uh, comes with it. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to skip on because of time to the role of the media, which uh, Kevin has alluded to in his presentation. Um, and which many of the politicians, of course, have spoken about. So many of them, when they talk about violence against women, it is coming from the media and now increasingly as well uh, from social media. Unfortunately, our chapter author uh, for this, uh, Teresa Nyangweda, is uh, busy in another um, webinar today is International Women's Day, so it's a very busy day. And so uh, being an area that I've taken some interest in over the years, I'm just gonna take you through a few of the top line findings uh, that we share here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much recent media monitoring on this. The data we have is from the 2020 uh, Global Media Monitoring Project. Some of you may be aware of it. It's a, a one-day monitoring that is done uh, across the globe of how are women's views and voices represented in the media. No surprise that at least 30% of the news that we consume is about politics, right? Politics is the big news agenda. 
Uh, that is true in the mainstream media as well as now increasingly on online uh, platforms as well, 25 to 30%. And yet, here's the pause for thought. Women are 51% of the population, but they only constitute 18% of those whose views and voices are heard in the news a little bit higher in the politics top, topic category at 22%. But let's go back uh, to Dr. Robert's point about inclusion. If we're talking about women being 51% of the population, but only 22% of those whose views are heard in politics, we are not there yet in terms of inclusion. And then let's add to that, that GBV, and especially online GBV, now constitute, constitutes one of the, the most serious forms of GBV that women experience. And as in all the barometer, we're going to have lots and lots of voices of women in our barometer, at least. We will hear women's voices. And we give two examples there, uh, Finas uh, Manjongwa, uh, Man, sorry, Mangondwa, beg your pardon, uh, youngest MP in Malawi, young woman MP in Malawi, who talks about the violence that she has experienced in the media, a video going viral because she gave an interview uh, in English that wasn't perfect, uh, but you know, is that the point uh, when you're in parliament representing uh, your communities uh, and how she was ridiculed on account of that? Really, really pause for thought in terms of you know, what is it that um, we are really valuing in, uh, in, in, in our political spaces. And then we also have uh, Joanna Beranger, the daughter of the former Mauritian um, prime minister, actually, Paul Beranger, uh, who talks about how the media has framed her as being the daughter of the prime minister and not a, a politician in her own right and how she has struggled to create her own individual identity. You'll read a lot more about her in the barometer because she's also uh, one of the few members of parliament who has breastfed her baby in parliament, for example. I think there's only one other I can remember, the former prime minister of New Zealand who broke all the rules at the UN, took her baby there and breastfed her, just making the point that uh, this is the real world, right? And let's bring the real world into our decision-making structures. So many interesting stories that you're going to read about um, various uh, 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 political functionaries and, and the media uh, in the upcoming uh, barometer. We're going to go to our last uh, uh, chapter, which is around this rather vexed question is, so we are promoting women's political participation. We are saying women have a right to be in politics. Of course, they do. But do they really make a difference? Uh, in other words, are we going from jobs for the girls to gender equality for our nations when we get more women in politics? Uh, do they make a difference? And we have our fifth poll question, which is men are better political leaders than women. Do we think that? Do we think that men are better political leaders than women? Um, I'm going to suggest that maybe we just post our thoughts in the chat in the interest of time, because we do want to wrap this up in the next few minutes to allow time for audience questions and participation, live audience questions and participation. So Susan, I'm going to, um, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, not Susan. I'm going to turn to Lynette to talk, who she is the one who did the chapter on men, uh, to talk to us about the role of men uh, in politics. And then we're gonna to go to Susan for whether, to whether or not women make a difference. So Lynette, over to you. Good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, and best wishes to all for International Women's Day today. It is a day to celebrate those who are in politics already and those who aspire to be in politics. The whole of this barometer goes through the number of barriers that women face in political participation. These barriers are almost all rooted in a very patriarchal culture and traditions where women are perceived to be in the private space of the home, 
rather than in the public space of politics. And that then flows into, they have, do not have the finances to participate. They, do, they experience violence of many different forms. They have very negative media coverage because who are you to be trying to participate where you shouldn't be? Um, they do not always have support from their own families, um, and particularly husbands, fathers, brothers, sons. Um, and some of them have low levels of confidence because they haven't had the experience that men have had. And in almost all of these levels of barriers, men are critical gatekeepers. They are the ones who are really holding things back for women. Um, and we need to engage with men, engage with these gatekeepers to be able to open the gates and engage with them as allies rather than as adversaries. There are men who are very open to being allies. There are programs that are finding these men at different levels, very locally, to begin participation from school governing bodies, from getting into local government, moving into parliament from there. There are small grassroots programs. There are more national and even regional programs. There are international organizations that are engaged with this. And you will hear more about that, all of those in the whole chapter. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for keeping it brief. Um, we're now going to go over, sorry, I jumped a little bit to the question about women make a difference. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to suggest, and I see we're using the chat very actively, that's great. Having women in politics makes a positive difference to society. Do we strongly agree, agree, uh, don't have a view, disagree? Having women in politics makes a positive difference to society. So we get women into these positions. Does it make a difference? Susan? Thanks, Colleen, and, and thanks everyone. I'm looking in the in the chat, and I think there's a unanimous, um, a definitely strongly agree. Um, you, and the, the barometer is grounded in the conceptual framework around access, participation, and transformation. So our premise that we start from is that uh, women need to have access. So we've been talking about some of those barriers to access, for example, electoral systems and quota systems. Um, and a number of others. But once they get, you know, once they are able to get access, um, you know, how are they able to, to participate? Um, and in the barometer, we we measure um, women's sort of participation in actual decision making through uh, looking at, you know, whether they're in cabinet, um, you know, how many of them are mayors um, of capital cities or mayors in general, uh, political party leadership, um, and the top executive positions, which we've seen um, are the two um, are the two that women are least represented in. And it's probably because the stakes are so high. Um, some positive um, some positive achievements or movements um, in Namibia, uh, Tembu Nandi Ndaitwa um, has recently become the president of um, SWAPO. Uh, she was the vice president. Uh, um, and she is said to become the first female uh, presidential candidate for Namibia. Um, unfortunately, this is following the passing away of the president, but he was going to hand over to her anyway. Um, so, so that was all part of the plan, which is a really good, um, which is really good progress, especially for Southern Africa, where we haven't had 
um, a uh, elected uh, female president. Um, in Benin, um, the, the head of state, they also um, chose a woman as vice president. But in Benin, their new electoral law actually says um, that if the president is um, a male, then the vice president has to be female. So there has to be an alternation there. And it is obviously something that they are following. Um, and it's, you know, part of their, their new quota, which resulted in them increasing 18%. Um, so in Africa, we see that there has been general progression around women speakers um, in, in all areas, 3% increase, I'm sorry, 4% increase overall. Um, and we see the biggest increase there in East Africa um, and in Southern Africa. Central Africa is also seeing some progress West has stayed the same, and then in the north um, and in the Horn, neither at the previous barometer nor, um, you know, the research for this one shows that they appoint uh, women speakers in the lower houses of parliament. Uh, what's really encouraging, um, even though the increase in women in local government isn't so big, um, overall, we see a 10% increase now in the number of uh, women who are mayors of capital cities, which is a which is a real um, which is real progress. Again, you know, the horn has been a topic of our discussion today, and there we've also seen um, that there's been a substantial increase, 23% increase in the number of female mayors um, in in capital cities in West Africa. The Horn um, has also shown good progress, but then Central Africa, and I think that this just goes to show that, you know, nothing is linear, has gone from 43% down to 29%. Um, Southern Africa, we went up marginally. Um, North, we can see, you know, they increased somewhat. Um, and then interestingly, um, East Africa um, doesn't have any speakers um, in, in their parliaments. Um, mayors, um, mayors. I'm sorry, Mayor, sorry, <laughs> I moved along. Um, okay, so top executive positions. Now we define those as president, vice president, prime minister, vice prime minister. Um, and we are seeing that there is an increase um, in this. We know that um, in Tanzania, we've got a female president. Uh, there are um, a number of other prime ministers. Um, and we are almost going to get another female president in Namibia. Um, there it increased somewhat. Um, so there is upward movement, the highest movement there in East Africa. Um, and, you know, in North Africa, we can still see, um, as with all of the other statistics, you know, it's staying it's staying with those in, in that there isn't much pro progress in terms of um, increasing women's representation. Uh, in cabinets, um, this we 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 have increased somewhat um, in all well in all countries ex in all regions except the Horn and Central. There's been there's been some progress, um, but regression in those countries. Uh, and what we'll find in the in the barometer is a little bit more detail around the kinds of positions that women are occupying. Um, because often, you know, they they occupy positions in the more social um, portfolios rather than defense or finance. And we have a great interview with the Minister of Finance um, from Botswana. Um, so, so you can look out for that. And then this is just um, as as all of the other authors had said, we we you know we putting uh, personal accounts um, throughout the throughout the barometer really to try and give a personal feel to to what we're saying in terms of the numbers because there's a lot of numbers, um, but what does that actually mean in practice? Um, and here we we have um, a, a female politician in Algeria who who worked. Um, who joined a, a party there, um, and she says um, that, you know, she, she in the Politburo, um, she was in charge of the environment, um, and they gave her the opportunity um, to promote this concept uh, throughout, um, and this has influenced the way that she works, um, and, and, and it influenced the ways that she leads. 
um, and she knows that it's not possible to propose political alternatives without knowing all of the aspects. So this just goes to show some of the um, some of the different approaches um, sometimes that women take, um, and the um, and the importance of having them there, especially in uh, the untraditional female um, dominated portfolios. As we pause for a moment for looking to the future, I see a very important question there about are we going to get the presentation? Uh, absolutely. Um, Mema Beta, um, I think you have the very latest version of it. Please do feel free to post it in the chat. Yeah. Uh, we also, by the way, have your email addresses through the registration that you did. And we're happy to um, send this to you by email as well. Susan, can I look to you as well to just take us through the couple of slides on looking to the future? Sure. Um, I So one of the things that we are now starting to look at, it's not something that we looked at in the previous barometer, um, but it is a really interesting area. And I know that International Idea, the IPU, um, are now even, well, the IPU is now actually um, providing statistics on, uh, on youth in parliament, because I don't know, as many of you know, we have the oldest politicians um in in the world and we africa has the youngest population in the world so we have as you can see here there's a young woman from zimbabwe she was on the junior council there and she says leaders are talking about children's issues but they're 65 and that doesn't make any sense <laughs> what can a 65 year old you know know about um the issues that we face so this is a real, it's a real barrier for women getting into politics, young women in particular. Um, and while only 2.2% 2, 2 .2 of parliamentarians are under 30, and less than 1% of them are young women. Um, and, you know, this is a growing area. We are seeing the importance of bringing in young women, um, bringing in young men into politics, and there's growing recognition of the importance of including them. Um, but if we're not seeing a lot of the results on that. Uh, so a lot more needs to be done in order to encourage um, and in order to build the capacity um, of, of young people wanting to go into politics. Wow, look at that quote there. Leaders are talking about children's issues, but they're 65, and that does not make sense. We can't have 65 years discussing issues that they probably don't even understand. Okay. As someone knocking on the door of 65, I'm taking good note. <laughs> All right. A last uh, nice quote there, Susan. <laughs> yeah, so this is a great quote, and you'll hear a lot more about her in the barometer as well um, from Burkina Faso. Um, and she was a young woman who who is part, she's one of, I think, four or five um, young women who's part of the Legislative Transition Assembly. Um, and then when she got to be part of that, she um, she tried to stand for a committee. Um, and, uh, you know, she says, unfortunately, I was not able to convince anyone this time. But I must admit that I'm proud to have been a candidate. It was a challenge I wanted to take up. What is more, in terms of the symbolism, it was important for me to show that a woman, especially somebody young, can aspire to occupy such a high strategic position in African society, heavily influ influenced by patriarchy. Very, very powerful stuff. Um, and, you know, all of, all of the stories, we've got a lot of brilliant um, stories from young women in the barometer. They're all inspiring um, and make me feel very positive for what the future might hold if they get into the higher levels of, of positions. Okay, you go girl. I think that's a great way to close our presentation. So uh, let's discuss. I believe, Mama Beta, that this is the point at which we hand back to um, um, International Idea to lead us through the discussion. So let me, through you, Mama Beta, hand over to you for this final segment of our uh, presentation, the discussion. Just a quick reminder that these are the chapters in the barometer. Uh, this is what you've it had a whirlwind tour through the chapter, in the introduction, electoral systems and temporary management, uh, uh, temporary special measures, political parties, electoral laws and management, violence against women in politics, the media, the role of men, making a difference and looking to 
future. So um, over to you, uh, Mema Betta and Josephine for the final piece. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mekolin, for that uh, informative session. I hope everybody has seen the PowerPoint. You can download to your device and be able to go over it as we have requested. Uh, Josephine, will you take us through the process or should I of question and answer? We want your contributions, anything, any ideas, any, any questions around what we have been presented with? Josephine? Uh, go ahead, Mabeta. Uh, I think everybody can post questions uh, on the chat box and uh, we will take the questions. Uh, Mabeta, please uh, begin and uh, we'll, I'll introduce the questions on the chat. Okay, we can also raise up your ha our hands whilst the, for discussion, for any views, any perspective, anything that has maybe have been triggered, we can raise up our hands for uh, the contribution whilst others are still posting their questions on the chat because we might not be able to take all the hands. Can I also take some uh, comments that have been put in the chat? Uh, mm -hmm. I think one is on uh, promoting equities. Um, there's a comment from Issa Tusa that says to promote equity, it is imperative to take vulnerable populations into account. Rural women often excluded from political opportunities and uh, greater support. Awareness raising and training programs specific to their needs combined with better access to resources can help eliminate uh, obstacles that they face. Um, women with disabilities and from minority ethnic groups are also doubly uh, marginalized. Um, if any uh, person in the team would want to uh, comment on this, and if the the barometer takes into consideration some of those uh, issues. Okay, maybe we can take a few comments if possible. Uh, that's a really good one that we can come to unless there's, you know, uh, if others. I, I'd be very surprised if everyone in this room had, had nothing to say. So speak up, speak out, <laughs> don't be shy, please. Uh, put up your hand, um, <clears throat> post in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to start picking on people I know in this room. <laughs> um, yeah, thoughts, questions? Okay, there's one from Emma Beth. Uh, okay, opportunities to extract recommendation. Okay, in terms of approach and target. Yes, we have Rebecca. Rebecca, please go ahead. Yes, Rebecca, please go ahead. Okay, I was trying to unmute myself, almost forgot what to do. Uh, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be on this platform this day. Um, I've been listening to all the presentations, and they are very, very interesting and very relevant. Um, the political space still remains uh, a no-go area for most women, and not surprised that it's happening across the continent would have loved to hear that at least well thanks to Rwanda they've changed the the playing field for a for a season which we hope will be something that we we'll all emulate yes the difficult things especially in mm. our country is that the political field is very dangerous and is very um not gender friendly women struggle in those areas and I think there's a lot of work that has been put by uh, most of the women's organizations to try and encourage women to get into politics as much as possible. Lots of women have been groomed, mentored, trained, you know, just to so that when the election time comes, they can be part of the, uh, they can be participants. But this has remained very limited because of all the pressures that they experience 
during the campaign period and even during the election. The mud um, uh, slinging that goes with that, the name calling, the sexist uh, comments, so much that discourages the next uh, pro uh, candidate that may have wanted to take place. So I think our fight still goes on and we do not want to give up on this because this is really where the difference will come. Uh, if a woman minister of health, for instance, comes on board, imagine what would happen to the maternal health issues, what would happen to sexual and reproductive health issues. They will be better placed than a male counterpart. So yeah, that's my take. Mm -hmm. We're still in a fight and we want to win this war. Thanks so much for the presentations. Thank you, Rebecca. Any more views? Now, Colin, I, I guess the presentation just drove home. Like everybody's views have been, or questions have been answered thoroughly through the presentation as seeing as we do not have the hands. Oh, Rumbizai. Uh, we have a hand up, Rumbizai. Yes, Rumbizai, I can see your hand now. Thank you, uh, Joyous, and congratulations to the team that is driving all this process, and thank you all for the presentations. So it's happy International Women's Day to everyone. One of the things I want to build up on in terms of what comes up to the barometer is really the ability for us as practitioners and women's rights advocates to untangle that whole gamut of issues, which I know, I think, and have been used in terms of as a conceptual approach. And I think Colleen and Josephine and colleagues who are working directly on the barometer can correct me. How we, I do? So, sorry? how we need to constantly invest on uh, investigating around issues of access, participation and representation, and the element that I believe is very important, transformative. What is happening, and this is a continuum, so that our interventions are not only dealing with issues of access, like for instance, as international idea we are collecting, a lot of data on the implementation of quotas around the world. But that is just one part of it. How are we dealing with the entire gamut around gender roles, rigid gender roles, social norms, stereotypes and practices? And I'm hoping the barometer will also be even a tool for collecting those issues around stereotypes. And most importantly, even the unequal paid care work, because that's one of the reasons why women are also underrepresented because of the triple gender roles and the responsibility that are assigned based on gender perceptions and expectations. And I believe we need to see a continuation of interventions that deal with the connections, the issues of access, participation and representation. When women are in those spaces, first and foremost, it's important that there is the participation, which is the politics of presence, having women's physical bodies in there. It's exceptional and it's a democratic imperative. And then how do we harness that politics of presence and translate it into the politics of having a voice and influence, which is about representation. And all of that connects with dealing with the gamut of issues that are problematic, social norms, social, rigid gender roles and responsibility. And of course, how do we get now which is something that we are already demonstrating in the work we are doing under WPP and shown by the barometer, engaging men and boys in all their diversity, not only 
to promote gender equality in terms of how it is a benefit for women, but also how they benefit and how it is a, a loss for men if gender inequalities are continuing in our societies. So thank you so much, colleagues, and we hope to continue to promote this work and the barometer in all initiatives that we are undertaking as international idea and showing it as a as a good practice of collecting gender disaggregated data because that's one of the thing elements that we need towards contributing to SDG five and the related targets. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I'm just noting as other hands are coming up, but there are two questions in French uh, from Kumor. Uh, Mariani, could you translate those for us? See there are two French questions in the chat from Kumor. Marianic, are you there? Marianic? Okay, maybe while she's doing that, um, are there any other questions? We, we would need to just wrap up the questions in two minutes and I will try to answer them very quickly in our remaining five minutes. Um, so any other? I, I, I see other more questions on the chat, uh, Nicolene, the other yes, ones. I've been, I have been uh, oh, taking you have notes those. of them. Yes, okay, I have been you. following them. Then we have okay, more. Two questions above. In, ah, okay, thank you. All right. Will be, uh-huh. Ah, okay. Will it be launched in other countries? Uh, as a talk to other teams. Both parties in government also opposition to that. Okay. Uh, all right, I believe I've got those ones. Any other quick questions? Otherwise, we'll just move to wrap up with some uh, closing thoughts uh, based on the questions that have been raised. Um, uh, maybe I'll... Yes, Colleen, yes. yes, in the chat box, the questions from the Comoros are translated. Yes, I just uh, scrolled to that. Thank you very much. Put those down. Mm -hmm. All right, um, in the interest of time, if it's okay, i um, just like to then move uh, on behalf of the uh, chapter authors to respond very quickly to some of the questions that have been raised. Um, I think there was um, a, a question more, like, more comment really about uh, to promote equity and inclusion. We need to be looking at women in all their diversity and also looking at women in all the different uh, geographical spaces uh, that we might find them. Uh, so women, uh, not rural women, by the way, but women living in rural areas, important distinction. How are we reflecting them? So I think that one of the things, um, you know, work in progress, but one of the things that we have done in this barometer and in the last one has been to really push very hard, not just on data on local government, but also to push very hard on stories. Uh, coming from the local level, because this is our best way uh, so far. That is the tier of government that is closest to the people uh, and where we should see the greatest amount of inclusion. This has been uh, our best way so far of uh, being able to get at that information. And of course, through the disaggregation uh, of data and through consciously looking out for parliament in parliamentarians who might come from uh, different uh, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity backgrounds, um, who might be living with disability, or who might be from indigenous communities. A uh, very interesting fact, a very interesting fact, South Africa uh, changed its, had to change its entire electoral law and will have a very interesting election this time around because it won't just be based on PR, because a woman from an indigenous community, from um, the original people of, of South Africa, the San uh, people, uh, challenge the constitution on the grounds that from that community where they do not organize in political parties, they didn't feel themselves represented by the PR system because it does not allow for independent candidates. And on account of that challenge that she made, the entire electoral system has had to be changed. So that's a very interesting story for you to look out for in, in the barometer, just to show how the inclusion of other voices uh, can result in an entire you know, paradigm shift in a country. Uh, from uh, our sister in Zimbabwe, I think uh, was more in the nature of a comment uh, talking about 
all these uh, barriers that lead to exclusion, uh, sexist comments, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, commenting on Rwanda and how they have managed to achieve what they have achieved. Uh, we thank you very much uh, for that comment. The story is much the same, uh, no matter where we go across the continent. But the question I, we always have to ask ourselves is, if some countries have managed to break those barriers, what is the reason behind it? One of the uh, subtexts that you'll find in the barometer, and this is a very interesting case, uh, not just in Africa, but across the world, is that there's a very strong correlation between post-conflict countries and higher representation of women in politics. And we need to ask ourselves, why does it take a whole war, a genocide, a conflict, yeah, to begin to shake up our societies and, and, and scatter all those uh, stereotypes uh, that keep women out of politics? But it's that, is a very interesting um, uh, link and association for us uh, to, to look at. So in the chat, there was a question about women as voters. Uh, why is it that women constitute the majority of voters? By the way, we skimmed very quickly through the chapter on electoral management, but you will have some data there on women as voters in Africa, and you will find that the majority of those who vote are women. So it's not that women are not interested in politics. They do vote the question you know, why they're not voting for women. So we know that it's not that easy. Uh, it's not that simple, rather not that it's not that easy. Um, we know that patriarchy does not just affect uh, women. It, uh, sorry, it doesn't just affect men, it affects women as well. Our structures, our systems, the first past the post system is a very patriarchal system. Uh, very often you only have male candidates, uh, or if you have women candidates, they have been severely disempowered in one way or the other. But we shall look at women as voters and how uh, they uh, behave. Another question that was asked is, why is it that TSM, even if they exist, are often not, uh, are not, often not um, uh, implemented uh, to their fullest? Uh, we had the example earlier today from Senegal. Uh, the law is for gender parity, but we're not actually seeing parity reflected. We have many other examples. Kenya is a good one where the constitution makes a provision, but that, that provision has never been actually implemented. Eswatini is another one. Many examples of where it's in a constitution, it's in a law, but it's not implemented. Uh, so I think the simple answer is that uh, we don't always observe our own laws, uh, case, you know, but that also, and this happened in Kenya, gives us the opportunity to use our constitutions and other things to use those means to challenge, because if the constitution says that, then we should be doing it. And if we're not doing it, uh, we should be called to order. Political parties, leaders, et cetera, should be called to order. So it's a method that has been used, and you'll read more about that uh, in the barometer. My sister, Rumbidzai, uh, makes uh, excellent points about um, these barriers and how do we begin to collect data around these barriers. So often when we talk about women's political participation, we look at the formal barriers, but we also look at the informal barriers. The informal barriers are those rather intangible things like custom, culture, and religion, and tradition, and all those other things that keep holding women back. Um, our socialization, et cetera, et cetera. Our schools, our education system. How do we begin to collect data on those barriers? Not as easy, of course, to, to gather that data as it is to gather some of the other, but we do it, of course, throughout the barometer through our qualitative case studies, those voices that you've heard and will hear more of have spoken very powerfully uh, around those issues. And then where we can get the data like media, some of those statistics we shared on women's voice or lack of it, um, we do have that uh, data as well. I love your, your, your model, uh, Rumbi. I love the words that we use. How do we move from the politics of presence to the politics of voice? And dare I say, how do we move from the politics of voice to the politics of change? Uh, these are really the three steps, uh, presence, voice, and change. Uh, access, participation, transformation, um, the framework that, that we use. So from the um, translation from the Comor, I believe that the question is whether we will launch the barometer in all the different countries. I hope so. I really hope so that together with International IDEA, we will make this available in English, French, and Portuguese, and through our networks and partnerships, encourage many different launches and many different uh, interpretations. And wonderful that there's interest in that in Comor 
let's uh, engage some more. Um, I didn't quite follow the second question, which was about is a calls for advocacy and an influential report for political parties in government, also opposition and society. I'm afraid I didn't quite follow that. If the question is whether we look both at uh, ruling parties and opposition parties, absolutely. In that chapter on uh, political parties, we do look both at the opposition parties as well as um, as well as the um, the ruling parties. I don't know if there are any questions I have missed, and I also see that we are now at the top of the hour. I believe we've tried to capture most of them. Any that I've missed, uh, Josephine? Oh, I think you have uh, gone through quite well, sorry. The question right. from the Pomols was, most voters in the African continent are women. How is it possible that women candidates are not in the majority and the few women candidates are not elected? And then in some countries, the temporary special measures are in place, but not applied. Yeah. So I think I, I did address that earlier, uh, particularly the temporary special measures. Uh, maybe just to elaborate on women as voters and women as candidates. Um, we spoke a moment ago about the fact that, that the, if you have a majority of women as voters, doesn't necessarily mean they will vote for women. So I think the question, uh, thank you for refining it, is slightly different. Uh, why are they then not candidates? And I think it's a very simple answer, which is candidature in politics is mediated by political parties. And we had that quote from Zimbabwe, I think it was a very powerful quote saying, especially in the first past the post system, you know, there's all sorts of barriers then within the party. You've got to go through a primary election. You've got to then uh, be um, assigned to a constituency. You probably will be assigned to a constituency where you're not going to win because the men will be assigned to the constituencies where uh, they know they will win. If it's the PR system, it's the same story, really. It's a question of where does the political party put you on the list? It's a list system. And if they put you at the bottom of the list, of course, you're not going to get in. So the major barrier there is a formal one. It is our own political party structures, hence that chapter really problematizing what our political party is doing. They seem to be way behind what they actually vote for in their own parliaments. Uh, thank you, Mema Beta Ovo. I think we're pretty much ready to close. Thank you, Mekwaline, for this elaborate presentation. Uh, I will now hand over to Josephine for the final wrap up and closure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, from International Idea, uh, we have Rumbizai. Uh, I'll just welcome her to say two things and wrap up officially. Uh, so just to say from WPP, we really appreciate the support from all the seven partners. And to say that uh, we hope that these top line uh, findings have um, increased your appetite to see the full report which we hope to launch uh, at the end of May this year. And uh, we want to say once again, our best and, and a lot of gratitude to the embassy of Sweden in uh, Addis Ababa for all the support to the WPP program. Thank you very much. Rumbi Zai, please, uh, could you wrap it up for us from the International IDEA headquarters? Rumbi, you're muted. Rumbi Zai, please. Okay. Uh, I think she's uh, she's still muted. Uh, but just to say then uh, to all the participants, we really appreciate your participation and uh, we look forward uh, to further enriching these discussions with a full report. Thank you very much and happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you everyone and happy International Women's Day for the rest of the day.